Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. At this time, I am going to ask Dr. Levine to please turn on your camera. Hi, Dr. Levine. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> the, the sentence of the 20s, of the 2000s. Yeah. Would you like to give the introduction for tonight's program? I would. Are we ready right now? We are ready to go. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, this rainy afternoon. We are so pleased to welcome Dr. Eddie Gloud with us today for our uh, program on the Black Family Representation, Identity, and Diversity. The, um, this is part of our annual celebration of Black History Month. Although I like to say we don't celebrate Black History Month just in February, we do it every day with the work we do at the Historical Society. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History has described the 2021 Black History theme as the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. We know that the Black family is not a monolith, but it's a crucial space within which to explore the rich fabric of the American, African American experience. In celebration of the Black family, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Eddie Gloud Jr., who is a New York Times bestselling author and the chair of Princeton University's African American Studies Department. He joins us today from Lawrenceville, New Jersey, where he tells me the snow is still a sparkling white. Um, his writings, including Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, In a Shade of Blue, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America, and his most recent work, the New York Times bestseller, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. And it takes a wide look in all of his work at Black communities, the difficulties, the unresolved difficulties of race in the United States, and the challenges that we face as a democracy. Most recently, Dr. Gloud has been featured in Time, uh, in the Times and now in the news about the breach of the Capitol and what's necessary to uh, pursue racial justice in this country following that crisis. We are so pleased to have you with us today. We're pleased to have our members and uh, the public join us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and thank you, Sister Shakir, for uh, all the work that you're doing and all the folks who are behind the scenes that are making, uh, that have made this, this event possible. And I want to thank you for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to hear me run my mouth, as my mother would say. Um, as I was thinking about uh, uh, this lecture, I wanted to um, address uh, the issue of Black family and, and representation, identity, and diversity against the backdrop of the pressing moment that we face as a nation. It seems to me that uh, we are in a moment of racial reckoning. And what is required, I think, is uh, a series of public reflections about how we've arrived here and how we might uh, make our way to the other side. And when I say to the other side, I'm, I'm thinking about how we might imagine ourselves otherwise. And in my own work, what I've been trying to do is to insist that we tell the truth about what we've done. And this, of course, is inspired by the writings of James Baldwin and others, but to insist that we bear witness to the consequences of what we've done as well. And in doing so, perhaps open up space for us to imagine ourselves otherwise. And so it's with that in mind that I tackle uh, the subject of the Black family and representation, identity, and diversity. Now I do so with clearly with in, my, in mind, um, you know, the kind of vast 
sociological literature and historical literature around the Black family. And I do so understanding that the Black family is a shorthand for a complex set of arrangements that have produced uh, uh, extraordinary people. And uh, I, I, I want to suggest uh, that have in some ways generated these extraordinary economies of care that have endured uh, despite American racism. I'm aware of the challenges, for example, uh, that, that one faces or confronts when reading, say, E. Franklin Frazier on the New Negro family or reading W.E.B. Du Bois and how he talks about families, for example, in, in the Philadelphia Negro or Robert Staples and the like. So there's this vast classical literature or historical literature that we can engage and contemporary work. But I want to do something a bit different given my uh, uh, beginning, given, given my brief introduction. Uh, in fact, I want to begin my remarks uh, with a brief account of, of a piece of, of journalism. And that is a brief account of Tana Hesse Coates' important essay, The Black Family in the Age of Mass Incarceration, came out in the Atlantic in October of 2015. And it was reprinted in his book, We Were Eight Years in Power in American Tragedy. In this essay, Coates takes up the sustained analysis of Daniel Patrick Moynihan's controversial report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. Right, that report, that document was meant to be an internal uh, piece of writing aimed at revealing the limits of the pending civil rights legislation. For Moynihan, I believe that there was a bit too much euphoria around the passage of civil rights legislation. For him, the problems of black communities cut much deeper and no single piece of legislation on his view could resolve them. As Coates writes, quote, the Negro family argued that the federal government was underestimating the damage done to black families by quote, three centuries of sometimes unimaginable mistreatment. That's a quote directly from the report. Three centuries of sometimes unimaginable mistreatment as well as quote, racist virus as the racist virus in the American bloodstream, end quote, which continued to plague Blacks in the future. So Coates wanted to grapple with this aspect of the Moynihan Report, a report that has uh, a controversial history, as it were, right? What we do know is that the reality of white supremacy in this country, Moynihan suggested initially, left Black, left black families battered and bruised, quote, while many young Negroes are moving ahead to unprecedented levels of achievement, many more are falling further and further behind. He goes on to list out of wedlock births, welfare dependency, high unemployment among black men, all of which reflected what Moynihan believed was a core problem at the heart of black families. That is this matriarchal structure, which produced this tangle of pathologies, especially when it came to the effects on black men who were, who were emasculated and unable to enjoy, enjoy the benefits of a patriarchal society. Uh, and we see even in this, in this moment, right, the way in which Moynihan is, is in some ways locating the problem in black communities right, with uh, uh, families that are headed by women. So black women become the bearers of the burden, right, of the problems of black communities. Now Coates notes that Moynihan had, host, had a host of proposed remedies to the problems as he diagnosed them. Uh, those remedies, however, were not included in the final document. But among the remedies he, he suggested was a guaranteed minimum income, that we establish a government jobs program, that we bring black men into the military and enable better access, enable better access uh, to birth control, that we integrate the suburbs. Uh, all of these were, were, were left out of the report and all of this Moynihan maintained, right, was important to addressing the core crisis, but it was left out because the proposed remedies, according to some, would have gotten in the way of understanding the nature of the crisis itself. 
Now, I think Coates is right to note that the Moynihan Report was greeted not as an account of the state, the state's responsibility in the circumstance, you know, for the circumstances of black families, that is the enduring effects of white supremacy on black families. But instead, the report offered, right, uh, how can I put this? It, it served as an indication instead of the moral failings of black families. Right? Now, remember the way in which Moynihan frames this. Right, is that we're having to deal with, quote, three centuries of sometimes unimaginable mistreatment, as well as the racist virus in the American bloodstream that has plagued Blacks or Black families and the future of African Americans, right? But here we see that the issue is not state responsibility or the enduring effects of white supremacy, but rather, right, all of this is an indication of the moral failing of Black families. And that shift quickly becomes a sort of default account of the problems of black communities. Broken homes, illegitimacy, and female-oriented homes, quote unquote. All of this uh, uh, is tied to so-called rising crime rates and, you know, and the like. So here we see the tangle of pathology that produce right, or produces uh, these. Uh, differential outcomes. Right? Now we must remember that Moynihan actually uh, worked in the Johnson administration. And as he watched the response to the report, how it was taken up by the right and excoriated by the quote unquote left, he wrote in a letter to his friend Roy Wilkins, quote, I'm now known as a racist across the land, end quote. And as the black movement radicalized, and as we saw cities erupt in flames, right? in some ways, Moynihan was radicalized. He found himself in the Nixon administration where he peddled the argument still about the black family. But it's, now we get language like, quote, lower class behavior in our cities right, is shaking them apart. Now, what Coates aims to show is that on one level, this discourse about the black family set the stage for the carceral state. So I'm trying to set up how this trope of the black family works, right? In our public policy debates, how certain kind of characterizations of the very ways in which, right, economies of care within black communities, right, have led to in some ways, at least according to this particular argument, has produced dysfunctional persons, right? Or people who, are solely to blame for their circumstances. So what Coates aims to show is that on one level, the discourse about the black family set the stage for the carceral state. Coates writes, quote, as the civil rights movement wound down, Moynihan looked out and saw a black population reeling under the effects of 350 years of bondage and plunder. He believed that these effects could be addressed through state action, they were through the mass incarceration of millions of black people. Right? And then the, the consequence, the conditions of black folk could be addressed by way of state action. In fact, they were through the mass incarceration of millions of black people. And of course that incarceration has had an, a horrific impact on black families. Think of the million or so black children who have a black father in prison or jail, or those who have lost their mothers as we've witnessed the skyrocketing rates of the incarceration of black women. So what Coates sets out to do among other things, and he does so I think in a compelling way, is describe the scope and breadth of the damage of the impact of what he terms the gray wastes and the discourses around black people and black families that justified it. And in turn, how black criminality, which flows out of this kind of increase in carcerality justified the state of black families and black people. Quote, the blacks incarcerated in this country are not like the majority of Americans. They do not merely hail from poor communities. They hail from communities that have been imperiled across both the deep and immediate past and continue to be imperiled today. Peril, Coates writes is generational for black people in America. And incarceration 
is our current mechanism for ensuring that the peril continues. Incarceration pushes you out of the job market. Incarceration disqualifies you from feeding your family with food stamps. Incarceration allows for housing discrimination based on a criminal background check. Incarceration increases your risk of homelessness. Incarceration increases your chances of being incarcerated. Again, the prison book helps us understand how racial inequality in America was sustained. Right? Despite great optimism for the social progress of African Americans, this is what Bruce Western, a Harvard, a Harvard sociologist wrote. He goes on to say that the prison boom is not the main cause of inequality between blacks and whites in America, but it did foreclose, but it did foreclose upward mobility and deflate hopes for racial equality. What Coates aims to show in this piece of uh, journalism, which draws on right, a vast body of sociological literature uh, around Black families and around the carceral state. What he aims to show is that the, Mo that the Moynihan Report, which once emphasized that, quote, white America must accept responsibility for the, for the state of the Black family, as he described it. It later, Moynihan himself later asserts the self-damaging, that the self-damaging behavior of the lower class Negro is the problem. And Coates wants to suggest that this basic assumption saturates, saturates liberal political discourse today. In some ways, what the piece aims to show is that right, the discourse around black families isn't just simply a conservative affair. You heard it in the rhetoric of Bill Clinton or in President Obama's critiques of black fathers and families. And the damage unleashed by this justification has been clear and horrific. And whether one agrees with Moynihan's account or not, the effects of mass incarceration has had concrete effects on black families, black communities and individuals. And this will require, quote, to truly reform our justice system, reforming the institutional structures, the communities and the politics that surround it. So to take up the trope of the black family, right, in some ways is to engage, right, in a certain kind of political intervention. And how we do so matters, it seems to me. Now I've spent this time with Coates to demonstrate how the trope of the black family has shaped our politics. And in so many ways, the family, the black family and black women have had to bear the burden of much of this nonsense. The black family has been represented as the root of our troubles, resulting in policies that have, have devastated black families themselves. But what Moynihan said in the report, apart from the patriarchal assumptions about the birthright of black men and the drivel that followed from such an assumption, what he said about the actual practice of white supremacy, that three centuries of unimaginable mistreatment and the racist virus in the American bloodstream that both have plagued black life, to my mind, remain decidedly true. What's ironic, of course, is that black families, however they are constituted, right, have provided a kind of protection against the storms unleashed by white supremacy that black families, even though they're being castigated within this political discourse, right? That they, in fact, however they're constituted, have provided a kind of protection against the storms unleashed by white supremacy. You think about uh, the recent data about the so-called absent black father. And what we have seen is that the data has shown that black fathers are actually more involved in the lives of their children than white fathers in the, in, in the United States. In fact, the data shows that what is being read as absent is actually the fact that they're not married to their babies, to, to the mothers of their children, right? But that fact alone does not mean that they're not involved in their children's lives. What's ironic is that black families themselves have provided a kind of protection against the storms unleashed by white supremacy. I'm reminded of this formulation 
by James Baldwin in his essay, The Uses of the Blues. And I'm gonna read a quotation from it. I'm talking, quote, I'm talking about what happens to you if having barely escaped suicide or death or madness or yourself, you watch your children growing up and no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you are powerless. You are really powerless against the force of the world that is out to tell your child that he has no right to be alive. And no amount of liberal jargon and no amount of talk about how well and how far we have progressed does anything to soften or to point out any solution to this dilemma. In every generation, Baldwin writes, ever since Negroes have been here, every Negro mother and father has had to face that child and try to create in that child some way of surviving this particular world, some way to make the child who will be despised not despise himself. Let me read that again. In every generation, Ever since Negroes have been here, every Negro mother and father has had to face that child and try to create in that child some way of surviving this particular world, some way to make the child who, we be, who will be despised not despise himself. I don't know what the Negro problem means to white people, but this is what it means to Negroes, end quote. What does it mean to imagine family under conditions of capture? How might one think of, right, the one's relationship to one's child when that child is the possession, the property of someone else and can be stolen in a minute, can be taken away from you in a minute? How does one imagine one's relationship to someone that you care about? I'm just thinking about the context of slavery now, right? When you know that you stand in a certain kind of relation with that human being who is the property of another. What do you do when your wounds are considered, you know, sites of capital accumulation? What is one's relationship to that child? What is one's relationship to that man or woman? What is one's relationship to love in a state of constant precarity? And what we do know is this, and that in the midst of that extraordinary violence, in the midst of that institution, however peculiar it might have been, where the notions of gender as Hortense Spillers lays out were, were, were in some ways undermined as black women could not inhabit this space of womanhood. And as Hortense Spillers says, that in, 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 and in not doing so, introduced right, an instability in the very ways in which this, these gender categories right, functioned and worked. We do know in the aftermath, in the collapse of, of slavery, what did people do? As Eric Foner noted, these former slaves just simply started walking, trying to find loved ones, trying to find family. You can read it throughout the text, right? Read it throughout uh, 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 these accounts, right? What do you see, right? You see, right, I, I, my mother was sold to North Carolina when I was such and such years old. I'm trying to find her. My brother was sold, sold to Mississippi. I'm trying to find her. My father, he, I missed him. My husband, he was sold up, you know, down in Alabama. Where, and you see literally these former slaves, these formerly enslaved people, literally searching out people that they love. Baldwin says, in every generation, ever since we have been here, every Black mother and father has had to face that child and try to create in that child some way of surviving this particular world. What is this world? It's a world defined by what I call the value gap, this belief that white people ought to be valued more than others. And that belief evidences itself in our social, political, and economic arrangements such that we see the distribution of advantage and disadvantage. And we have to figure out how to raise our children in this environment, how to instill in them a sense of self, right? Where they can actually navigate it without actually being destroyed. And this insight remains relevant, at least to me. I found myself after the murder of Tamir Rice and triggered again by the recent treatment of a nine-year-old 
black girl in Rochester, New York. I don't know if you've seen this case when uh, uh, the parents of the child called 911 because they thought the child was having uh, a mental health episode. And, nine, and the police were deployed and the police handcuffed the child, threw her in the back of a police car. And when she continued to fight and refused to sit in the car calling for her father, the officer pepper sprayed this nine-year-old baby, screaming at her, you're acting like a child. And ironically, the child said, I am a child. But I found myself, me, after the murder of Tamir Rice, writing an open letter to my own son. And we published those letters in Time Magazine. I wrote, quote, I find myself more often than not, and upon reflection, this is an, is an astonishing thing to say, no less think, wishing you were seven years old again. You were adorable at seven. The vexations of the teenage years were far off and you still liked me. But I say this not because I find having an empty nest unbearable, although at times I do, or that I long to raise a teenager again and eventually you would be that maddening teenager again. I say it because I feel that you would be safer at home with us. That's what I wrote in part to myself. But he responded. And he responded in such a way that stopped me in my tracks. Quote, funny, I find myself wishing that I were a kid again, too. The world seemed so much simpler back then. But then I remember Trayvon, then, then I remember Tamir Rice. I remember Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and Ayanna Jones. I look at the face, faces of countless black bodies piling up in our streets. And I remember my own experiences with police officers as a kid. The struggle must continue that for our future's sake, end quote. Here, an upper middle class black family struggling with the realities of a world organized in such a way that places my child in danger. You know, in Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois said that if you wanted to know the meaning of blackness, right, that's all you had to do was look in the back of a Jim Crow car. Perhaps today we might say that's all you need to do is look at black children. Right? Part of what I'm trying to get at is that this trope of the black family, right, takes us to the heart of a set of discourses, right, a set of policies, right, about a set of policies that reflect a certain kind of valuation. Stereotypes about black families, the refusal to account for the challenges black people and black families face, the ironic reversal of blame, that the real problem is the tangle of pathology that is of our own doing, that that serves right, to shift the focus of concern. Remember what Moynihan said, three centuries of sometimes unimaginable mistreatment a racist virus in the American bloodstream. And yet we find ourselves, right, over and over again, right, singling out certain kinds of behaviors, certain kinds of choices, right? Blaming black families for the state of black life in some ways. All of this has distorted our perception an understanding of the complex ways Black families are constituted, of the beauty and power of Black families. Now, I'm not engaged in a wholesale kind of romanticism. This is not to say that there aren't uh, Black, you know, troubled Black families. I mean, that would, be, that would be silly, right? And in fact, it would be the kind of inverse of the very stereotype that I'm trying to resist, right? One of the things that we have to insist upon is that Black families, like, like Black people, are like everybody else, right? That is that we have our problems, right? 
We experience divorce. We experience breakups, right? We come with our moral trauma to, to with our with our own historical trauma and wounds to our relationships, and they have an impact, right, on how we actually live our lives, on the children we raise, and the like. We're human beings, after all. But sometimes we find ourselves battling on the ground, set by a whole set by a whole host of bad assumptions about black families. Assumptions, as Coates reminds us, that are not the possession of the conservative right, but often, often, we find them circulating in the very language of those who claim to be our allies. One way to put this is that, you know, we're, we're either um, Willie Horton or Bigger Thomas. Hmm? <laughs> I, I don't know if you mentioned, I, I did probably just dated myself. What does it mean to be considered or thought of as Willie Horton Right? That is, that is, we're, we're prone to a certain kind of criminality, right? And that criminality requires a kind of state, a state intervention, state sanction, right? A certain kind of policing that justified the war on crime, that justified mass incarceration, right? Or we're bigger Thomas, right? We're the result of our environments, those tangles of and pathologies, right? We're, in either case, we are, we are thought of uh, in terms of deficits, as it were. Like the point of departure, where we begin is with deficit. And let me be clear, this is not just in one hand, right? We see a lot of this, this language, right, is a carryover from the work of E. Franklin Frazier, from the Victorian assumptions of W.E.B. Du Bois, right? And in some ways, when we fight our battles on the ground set by a host of bad assumptions, Oftentimes we find ourselves engaged in an uncritical embrace of representation where we end up reproducing certain assumptions about the patriarchal family. Where we pine for the ideal that often serves as the basis for the harsh judgment of the actual families on the ground. I should say that again, should I say that again? I wish I could see you because I could see your faces whether or not the point um, uh, landed. When we find ourselves battling on the ground, set by bad assumptions, we often end up uncritically embracing a certain kind of representation where we produce, reproduce certain assumptions about the patriarchal family, where we pine for the ideal that often serves as the basis of the harsh judgment of the actual families on the ground. I mean, you can think about it the 1980s, the mid 80s in particular, and what the Cosby show represented for so many. Think about how Cosby himself traded in some of the similar tropes that Moynihan used. I mean, we have to be mindful that when we fight on the terrain of representation, we must be fully aware of the minefields, right? Oftentimes what, what we're trying to do, what happens, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a malevolent intention or not, what happens is that we see the flattening of the complexity of black life, right? We wanna reduce black life to certain assumptions about right, our pathology or our greatness. Right? Black families are complicated, just like human beings generally are complicated. Hmm? Now I say all of this, again, not to deny the problems we face. That would be silly of me. Coates insisted that we understand the effects of mass incarceration on black families, and he's right to do so. The tangle though of racist policies have devastated our communities, I wanna be clear. We have to forcefully assert that fact and resist the transfer of blame while understanding that our choices do matter that our choices do in fact matter. But apart from all of this, uh, as you rightly know, black families are wondrously diverse. And again, like families across this country, they face the difficulties of our current days. Ours carry the burden, however, disproportionately of a country sick with the virus of racism. And just to echo where I began, COVID-19 has revealed the deep fissures in our society. 
We know who's dying disproportionately from the virus. We know who are experiencing economic dislocation disproportionately. We know that we see families uh, in food bank lines. And we know that poor black and brown families are disproportionately re represented among their numbers. Ours carry the burden of a country sick with the virus of racism as we grapple and struggle with right, called the coronavirus today. Yet even so, we still thrive, at least some of us do. I'm reminded of James Baldwin again, and an essay he wrote in 1964 entitled, Nothing Personal. While in Puerto Rico, on vacation with his lover, Lucien Happisberger, Baldwin grappled with the news of the assassination of Mega Evers, the ugliness of America imposing itself on us. And he began writing the essay, Nothing Personal, under the shadow of Medgar Evers' death. Now, while he's in Puerto Rico, Baldwin would fly his family to the island for a birthday celebration. They would later join him there. Even his mother, Burtis, who did not like to fly, came. Now, we must understand the backdrop of Baldwin's family. Baldwin's family grew up, right, in Baldwin grew up in Depression Harlem, born in August of 1924 one of nine children, his stepfather, right? Relentlessly cruel in his treatment of not only him, but the rest of the family, having everything to do with his difficulty, as Baldwin would say, of putting food on the table. His father eventually going mad, right? With tuberculosis, as well as with his inability, right? To provide for his family. Baldwin, right? In some ways, will let you know over and over again, just read Notes of a Native Son, read, read all of his work, really. And you see that his childhood was not, you know, a crystal stair, as it were. But this day, on this day, he flew the entire family to the island. And his mother, Burtis, came. And among the many joys they all experienced, the family sat and read parts of Baldwin's new play, Blues for Mr. Charlie. So between death of Meg Evers, right, the imposition of the ugliness of a world organized along the lines that some people ought to be valued more than others. Between death and love, the love of his family, Baldwin found a way. In some ways, the essay, nothing personal, is a eulogy of sorts, a declaration of the will found in the love of family. In the end, the power of love of loving someone and of being loved, equips us to endure the world as it is and to imagine the world as it could be. All of those black moms and fathers who work desperately to keep the world, the ugliness of the world from taking root in their child. Watch as some many bloom and despair, as many languish in prisons. Or as, they, or as they have to bury them over and over again. Even the emptiness of America, Baldwin argues, can be overcome. Families are at the heart of it. We have the litany of the saints to bear witness to such a fact. They are those who, through the horror and brutality of American life, still loved and refused to die. William James answered the question, is life worth living by asserting the power of belief? If you believe life is worth living, that belief will help create the fact, James says. Baldwin finds no comfort in such abstractions, especially at that four o'clock hour when despair has one by the throat. Instead, the answer is found in the love of others, in the love of family. Who very, who very well may help bring us through the storming sea. The kind of love that has and can break the sickness at the heart of America's darkness. Thank you so much.
Dr. Glaude, thank you so much for your presentation. I am blown away. Um, the way that you were able to deconstruct this year's Black History Month theme, it really got me. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we are going to switch gears and we are going to answer some questions. Huh? And it looks like we have, oh, it looks like we have a few here. Um, there's a lot of thank yous. <laughs> so I think people enjoy the presentation. But this one comes from Edwards. As Coates has written, we were eight years in power. The Obamas were the epitome of the American model, the American model family. Yet at almost every turn, white supremacists and so-called Christian nationalists did not miss a beat questioning their intellect, their faith, the merit of their accomplishments, even their appearance. What do we do with this moving the ball and moving the line of acceptance? That's a wonderful question. And it goes to the heart of what I was trying to gesture at with the perils of representation. That when we think of representational politics as a response to a broad set of discursive practices around Black families or around Black bodies generally, we find ourselves in those moments fighting on a particular battleground that has been set by a set of, by a set of assumptions. And so whether it's the politics of respectability, right, which, which seeks a certain kind of, of view of Black folk as respectable over and against, right, a sullied uh, lower, right? Or you think about, you know, Dr. King couldn't be seen smoking a cigarette or you had to wear a certain kind of clothing, right? In order to be seen as the respectable black person, which will uh, in some ways heart lessen the judgment of one, right? Or when we think about uh, some of the victims of police violence, oh, this was a straight A student as if the fact of their academic, academic acumen matters in, in the execution uh, of deadly force. So part of what I'm saying is that no matter what the Obamas did, how they represented themselves, those assumptions about their bodies would continue to circulate. So there is a limit to representational politics, right? You can only go so far. Now, that, that's not to say that representation by definition is bad. That's not to say that a politics of respectability by definition is bad. No, but I'm just trying to suggest that the, the outer limits of it, right, that it can only take us so far. Thank you. Our next question, oh, they're, oh, oh, they are rolling in, <laughs> comes from Caleb. What does the value gap in higher education look like to you? Wow, that takes us this way. Um, thank you, Caleb. Um, what does value gap? Oh, it looks in, in so many, oh, in so many different ways. It, it evidences itself. Well, it evidences itself in admissions policies, right? Who gets admitted and who doesn't? depending on what school you apply to, right? Um, you think about, you know, vaunted state schools and who has access to those and who has access to, to local community colleges. We know that is evidence there. It's evidence in the ways, just look at the way faculties are constituted, who gets tenure, who doesn't, whose work is valued, who is, whose work isn't valued. Um, uh, it, it, it's evidenced it in uh, the makeup of of administrations who, who actually lead these institutions and who sits on boards. Um, it, I mean, I could go on and on, right? Um, uh, institutions of higher education can be in some ways critical battlegrounds for, or critical sites for us to imagine ourselves otherwise, but they're also critical spaces to reproduce certain kinds of ideo ideological practices that that, that, that fortify uh, uh, unjust arrangements. So yeah, that's, I could go on and on about that one, actually. Well, thank you, Caleb, for that question. Um, we have a few thank yous. Oh, Lindra Marshall, thank you, Professor Glaude. It's always a blessing to sit at your feet and learn more about the Black family, your friend and public student. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we have another question from Cheryl. How do we reconcile racism against Black people and the responsibility of Black people to combat it with, with stopping Black-on-Black -black crime 
and the other ills we perpetrate in our own communities? You know, this is an important question to address because it, it's part of uh, uh, the tangle of racist policies or racist politics, right? And, and what I was trying to do is to shift, remember the tangle of pathology. I'm, I'm trying to play on that phrase, which places the blame on black communities for, for the circumstances of their lives, the material conditions of their lives that impact the kinds of choices that they have and the way in which we go about navigating space and time. And I'm trying to play on that phrase, the tangle of pathology with the tangle of racist policies and practices. So let's be very clear that the very phrase black on black crime is actually a canard. It's, it's a red herring, right? Because we don't have a similar phrase of white on white crime. So we know that America is residentially segregated. We know that we typically live in, in, in segregated communities. And crime typically happens in the communities that you live in. So black on black crime is actually a reflection of the hyper segregated nature of, 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 of the United States. So I want to just, that's an argument, that's a claim I'm willing to defend, right? And that, so that the, that, the, that the language or the phrase black on black crime is, is, is aimed at shifting the blame. It becomes a tool within this broader discourse of pathology. So as we talk about out of wedlock births, as we talk about right single parent households, as we talk about uh, rising crime rates, right? Black on black crime is one of the critical formulations within that broader discursive practice. So the first thing we need to say is why aren't you talking about white on white crime? I, I lived in Maine. I worked at Bowdoin College for, for six years. And Maine is one, is I think it's the whitest state in the union. There's no concept of black on black crime. I mean, I mean, it could be, but no one was talking about white on white crime in po impoverished white neighborhoods in Maine, in, in, in Brunswick or in Portland, right? So part, although they might be since hillbilly elegy and the like these days, um, which in some ways pathologizes the white poor, but we can get into that some other time. So part of what I'm trying to suggest here is that talking about the difficulties of black, that black communities, resource deprived black communities face, right, is important. But where do we locate responsibility for these? Of course, there are folks who are making bad choices, but they're also resource deprived communities. Think about schools, think about social services, think about jobs and the like. And this is one of the ways in which people are really thinking about defund the police as a phrase. Let me just get into this really quickly. For some, defund the police represents right, an abdication of one's responsibility to deal with right, crime-infested neighborhoods and communities. Well, that's one way to think about it. Some people think that defund the police actually is an argument about the abolition of police. Well, that's another way one can think about it. But I think the way in which most activists were using the phrase is that defund the police is actually about how one budgets one's values. What does it mean that municipalities are spending 60 to 70 to 70% 70 of their budgets on policing and incarceration? And, and doing so, not spending the requisite amount of, of resources on social, social services, right? On job training, on health care, and the like. What happened to Walter Wallace in Philadelphia? His mother called the Philadelphia Police Department because uh, called 911. I'm sorry, call 911 because. Her son was having a mental health episode. They send the police. She had to bury her son. The family called the 911 in Rochester, right? What happened? The nine-year-old is handcuffed, thrown in the back of the car and pepper sprayed, right? What does it mean to, in, in, to talk about defunding the police as budgeting one's values? The same thing holds when we talk about black on black crime and black responsibility. Of course, we need to talk about our responsibility in our communities but we need to understand the phrase black on black crime as part of this discursive practice that shifts the blame that is on us as opposed to right, uh, uh, the fact that the communities themselves are resource deprived. That was convoluted, I'm sorry. Nope, that, and the questions are rolling in. So I wanna just, we're gonna continue to dig into some of these questions. So our next question comes from Theta. 
uh, please share with individuals what individuals may do in their capacities to bring about positive change? Um, you know, that, that question, I'm asked that question from in a number of different ways by a number of different you know, constituencies. Look, I think what we have to do is get clear on our conception of justice. What does a just society look like? You know, is it is it, is it a do we have a just society if 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 children born uh, living in a certain zip code or having being a certain color aren't getting access to the best education they can get? Is that a just society? Are we living in a just society if you can work forty hours a week but you're not really making a living wage? You're struggling to put food on the table and keep a roof over your house over your head. Is that a just society? Is it a just society that? We don't treat people equally under, no, everyone is not treated equally under the law. Is that just? So part of what I'm asking here in this moment is what is your conception of justice? And not treat black people as if we're somehow outside of that question. One of the most annoying questions that Jimmy Baldwin ever faced, he hated this question, is what else does the Negro want? He hated that question. And the reason he hated that question is because it revealed that the person who asked it didn't think of him, didn't think of him as a human being like he was. Because Baldwin said, oh, you know exactly what I want. I want what you want. I want exact. So part of what I'm saying, and here I'm echoing Ella ba Miss Baker here, is that get a clear sense of what justice means for you. And once you have that clear sense, then you, what you need to do is right in front of you if that makes sense. It does, definitely does. Okay, it looks like we have three more questions. And unfortunately, after we get through these questions, we're gonna start wrapping up the program. Um, this question comes from Miss Yolanda. Hi, Yolanda. With the temperature of our world, do you see a rise in organizations like the Black Panthers? Oh no, you know, what did Mark say in the 18th Brumaire? The first time around is tragedy, the second time around is farce. Mm. We don't need another Black Panther Party. We don't need another Dr. King. We don't need another James Baldwin. We don't need another Malcolm X. What we need uh, is another Shakia. We need another, you know, Derek. We need, we need, we need to step up in our time. We are the leaders we've been looking for. We are the giants. We just have to, we just have to admit it. So the organization that we will create under these conditions will look very different. Uh, so I don't want a nostalgic longing for organizations from the past. I want us to respond in our time, in our voice, in our moment. And let's see what happens. Okay. Our next question comes from Kathy. Thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. While Black families and the love found therein serve as safe spaces against white delusions of supremacy, it seems that confronting racism serves to tear white families apart. How can one white person confront fascism within his white families without tearing that support system apart? Oh, wow, I mean, that is such a hard question. Mm. Mm. You know, when I invoked uh, Jimmy's family and I said he had a difficult childhood, Baldwin had to leave home. You know, because he knew that if he stayed, um, he probably wouldn't have survived. Stepfather had issues with, you know, his sexuality, his his sense of self. Um, I even ran away from home at 16 to go to college. I knew what I was running from. I was running from my father. So I'm not romanticizing. Black families. I mean, so I'm, I'm just trying to address the first part of the question. I'm not romanticizing. Sometimes you got to love people from afar. You know, sometimes you got to love people uh, in spite of themselves, right? Um, and the and I say that fully knowing what it what it what are the implications, right? But it is precisely our willingness to allow people we love to spew toxins into the world, to do hateful things without holding them to account 
that continues to reproduce the world that does so much damage. We have to call out our loved ones in love, with love. Uh, that's hard to do. I understand. But, you know, we have to. Or the country won't survive. Well, on that note, we have a lot of thank yous pouring in. Um, Mr. E. Clark, thank you, Dr. Glaude. I teach entrepreneurship classes to seventh and eighth graders in St. Louis. I watch you and others on MSNBC to keep our class conversations on the level that our students can understand their reality and work to grow to improve life for others as we grow. Keep writing and keep teaching. Thank you. Uh, Tracy says, we thank you again for your message. You have empowered our St. Louis, our St. Louis community. I'm ready to do the work. Awesome. Well, with that, I, again, blown away. I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation as much as we did. Um, it has truly been a blessing to host you this evening. Um, before we close out, I would like to thank our program sponsors, McDonald's of Metro St. Louis. Thank you so much for supporting uh, the African American History Initiative and for supporting all of our Black History Month programs. We greatly appreciate your support. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please visit us at mohistory.org for more information on some of our upcoming programs and feel free to come back. We want you guys to really enjoy everything that we have to offer. So again, I want to thank our presenter this evening, Dr. Eddie Glaude. You are absolutely amazing. And for those of you who may have come in a little bit late, this recording will be available on our YouTube page. Um, you should check back probably next Monday, just to be, just to be clear. Um, but I, again, I just want to thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Take care. Stay safe, everybody. Good night.